Hey everybody, it's Shannon. I'm really excited to introduce to you our guest for today. How'd I discover him? I'd actually Googled Arabic tattoos because I was just curious about how my video would rank, right? And on the first page of results, there's this article in The Atlantic by somebody with a very un-Arab name. It was uh, Dr. Kevin Blankenship. And I was like, oh, I get really excited when I see somebody who, who I don't think is a native Arabic speaker. And who learned, you know, just like me. And so I found him on Twitter and um, it turns out, yeah, he's an assistant professor at BYU, which, you know, some of my siblings went there. So I was like, oh, wow. And he's also from Northern Virginia, like me. And he's like super prolific. Like he's been published in not only in the Atlantic, but like the LA, LA, Time, LA Book Review and the Times and all this other stuff. And I was just like super impressed. I mustered up the courage to ask him do an interview with me and he kindly agreed. All right, so without further ado, El Ustaz Blankenship. Well, I was so, I mean, did I tell you how I found out about you? I, I, I saw your article. Yeah, you said you read the Atlantic thing that I wrote. <laughs> yeah, I, I, cause I was Googling Sorry. Arabic tattoo cause I was curious, cause I have a couple of YouTube videos about Arabic tattoos and I was curious okay. how they were ranking in the search. And I saw your article, I was like, Hey, this person, like, you know, listen, Mishadabi, like, let me find out who. It, and so, um, yeah, that was super, like, you're a, a great, such an impressive writer. I was like, wow. that's really sweet. Yeah. No, that was a weird, um, well, it, it was, that sort of came along because I was, I was starting to do more public writing, as we say in academia. Um, and um, it's normally not the sort of thing that I'd write about, to be honest. But, uh, you know, I, it was the sort of thing that, like, I felt, you know, broader readers could get into. It also happened to be something that I'd had some experience with recently. You know, I, I, I mentioned a student in that article who came to me and, you know, wanted to check to make sure her tattoo was, or, or to, to make sure the word that she was looking for, the phrase she was looking for was correct, which is good on her, you know, like a lot of people just kind of go out and get something uh, and don't check, which is unfortunate. So Very. Um, think before you ink. Um, Got it. But about okay. the Middle East, there are there there is a burgeoning tattoo scene there, um, and in fact, I was going to write an uh, a follow up on that article about like these sort of uh, I wouldn't call them underground tattoo parlors, but like in some places they have to be more secretive than others. In Morocco, it's a little uh -huh. more open, just because like especially on sort of coastal cities that are more French inflected, Western inflected, they have uh, they have more of these places where you can just go. Uh, and same, uh -huh. but. But in, in some place like Jordan, which is a little more conservative than Morocco, mm -hmm. um, you know, th there's there's tattoo parlors there, um, and 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 they're fairly op like open about it. Like they have listings on like if you Google them, they're on Google and they're on Yelp and things like that. Ah, oh, so, well, there's I, I was in Jordan like three years ago, four years ago. Yeah. And um, from the like just walking in Amman in the streets, I was like, I I, I it wouldn't I didn't see one a tattoo parlor, but it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. From like, yeah. it seems like a lot more deaf. It's not like Dubai, you yeah, know, right. like. Right. Yeah. Depending on, depending on the part of town. Um, I mean, youth culture in the Middle East is uh, something that needs to be talked about more, I think, especially because I think a majority of populations in many of these countries in the Middle East are like under 40 or even under 30. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and, and, you know, there's a, in the same way that there's been sort of a sea change with millennials and Gen Z uh, in in the West, quote unquote, West in America yeah. and Europe, it's the same thing is happening in in the Middle East. So anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's so cool. Well, I, I, I want to know first of all, I want to know the story, like your journey, like what made you <laughs> want to learn Arabic? And like, tell me that whole story. Yeah, sure. So I didn't grow up speaking Arabic. I don't have Arabic uh, or Middle Eastern heritage in my family, although I do have a great aunt who immigrated from Poland and she married a Lebanese man. But I didn't know this growing up. I only figured oh, wow. it out after I started taking Arabic in college. Their last name is it's Mansur, but oh. my mom would always pronounce it Monser. And I didn't know I didn't know oh. anything about the region. I didn't know enough to know that this was a very common That's a Arabic big name. The, 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 yeah, I know yeah. El Mansur family. Okay, wow. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, at some point during college, I put it together. But other than that, like no exposure growing up. I did grow up in the Northern Virginia sort of DC area. So people would talk politics a lot. So that kind of got in my blood pretty early. But, um, you know, for myself, I never, I never wanted to study politics so much. I was always kind of an artsy kid. I like drawing, I like writing. So um, I was kind of more into the cultural aspect of it. So when I was 19, I served a two year religious mission in Brazil and ah. didn't, didn't learn Arabic there, but I learned Portuguese. And that right. was the first time 
uh, I had learned a language to real fluency. And it sort of, it, it, it turned something on inside me that I didn't know was there. And I was like, oh, this is, you know, this is going to be a big part of my life, whatever I do. So I came back, started as a student at, at Brigham Young University and uh, had no plans to study Arabic, wasn't even on my radar screen. But then I figured out, discovered that BYU has one of the largest undergraduate Middle East studies Arabic programs in the country. In fact, it, oh, wow. the, school, the school graduates more Arabic majors, like undergraduate majors, than any other country in the nation. Um, oh, wow. Which, yeah, which, Wait, you know- so to, Any other, even more than, because I thought Georgetown, that's where like Al-Kitab comes from, like the Al-Kitab method. Yeah, so um, this might not have been the case, uh, I, you know, and I don't know the statistics, this might not have been the case, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, Georgetown has actually switched focuses um, from a strictly sort of sociolinguistic Arabic pedagogy model to more like sort of Arabic, and Islamic culture, ah, okay, with Arabic as a as an important complement, but um, you know, oh, it's, interesting. It's, it's not as as much of a, a focus as it used to be. So, mm-hmm. but Georgetown, it's, they're still they still produce fine Arabic students, and I'm talking more strictly on the undergraduate level. Okay, Georgetown yeah, yeah. has you know an, an MA program, a PhD program, uh-huh. and things like that. But wow, yeah. Okay. So I I started studying Arabic at BYU. Really fell in love with it. The first class I took, all, all the Muslim listeners are going to love this. Uh, so I took a, a 101 class and one of our assignments was to memorize the call to prayer, the event. And uh, oh, no it, was the, way. it was the first time I had ever heard it. Again, growing up in a, you know, oh, sort of average. Akbar. I heard it all the time in Dubai. So. Yeah. Yeah. Which is funny because like, it's such a, it's such a, a mundane thing in the Middle East, like it, you know, in tones five times a day and like all over a city, depending on the city. But um, yeah, I, I, I fell in love with it absolutely fell in love with it. I was like, this is, it was so beautiful and haunting and, and just really struck a chord with me. So right from the get go, yeah. I, I knew I had an interest in the, in the language and the culture and in the region. And then uh, after that, I, I kept going with it. I, I ended up majoring in comparative literature, but mm-hmm. you get to study foreign languages as part of that. And I was interested more in sort of the literary and cultural side of things than like political science or economics. Got it. So continue studying. Go ahead. Do you have a question? Well, so how is it structured though? Like, so the first semester of Arabic, is it like you're just learning Fusha and are you learning a dialect or like, how does it, all, how does it work with the language? Part? So B- BYU continues to be distinguished as a school from other schools that teach Arabic because it teaches dialect alongside Fusha from the very okay. first class. We still do that now. We did it when I was a student, you know, uh, 14 years ago. So um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's still unique in that regard. There are more schools that are doing it now, I think. But uh, it was sort of a path setter, along with Cornell and also Georgetown, as you mentioned. Was it with Egyptian? Which dialect was it Egyptian? So when I was a student, okay. you know, I started studying Arabic in 2004, and back then we learned Egyptian Arabic as the dialect. Okay. And uh, you know, the the study abroad program. We have our own study abroad program at Jordan. We partner with the Qasid Institute in uh, in in Amman. Okay. Which um, didn't always used to. You know, in the years past, it's been they've gone to. Egypt, both Cairo and Alexandria. They've gone to Jordan, of course, but more recently to Jordan, especially after 2011. So um, there, yeah. So when I was a student, Egypt was more common as a, a destination for people learning Arabic. It's come back to be that now, but after 2011 and then the events of 2013, the economy is still not as good as it once was. Like when I was there, I, I, I should say I, I did CASA, I'll talk about that in a minute, but Center for Arabic Study Abroad, it's an advanced oh, Arabic okay. program. But uh, when I was there in Egypt in um, from 2009 to 2010, the exchange rate was $1 to five Egyptian guinea. Okay. And now it's like a dollar to 15 Egyptian oh, guinea. Okay. And it's still, it still is that way. And I think that's post 2013, especially. Yeah. Anyway, all that's to say that Egypt politically and economically has become less viable in the minds of programs that send students abroad to study Arabic. And so we shifted focus more to Jordan. So now when I teach classes, uh, I teach Jordanian dialect oh, cool. as well as Fusha. Oh, okay, that's great. So yeah. when you so when you started, you were learning Egyptian and Fosha, and then you you also learned Jordanian, right? And um, did you travel around like all the, through the Middle East when you were there? So my first trip uh, to the Middle East was to Jordan in two thousand six. 
Okay. And I went, it's funny, I didn't go as part of a, a, a proper Arabic study abroad program. I went with a group of public health students for various oh. reasons I couldn't go. We, do, we did have the study abroad program back then, but for various reasons of timing and money and things like that, mm -hmm. I couldn't go. So I went with another group, but had a great experience. I was there for two months and that sort of kicked off my, you know, a new phase, which was being able to live in the region and get to know the people and, and the culture a little bit better. So I went to Jordan in 2006. Um, in terms of going back to the region, I went back to Egypt for a full year, 12 months from 2009 and 2010. And that was on mm. CASA, which I mentioned before, it stands for mm. Center for Arabic Study Abroad. And uh, it's been it's been around since 1967. The U.S. Department of Education funds this program to cr oh. to 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 produce um, people with a high level of language in uh, this part of the world that they deem to be important. And again, this is Department of Education. It's not state or DOD. So, uh, you know, it's a, kind of the soft power side of things where we're producing experts in the region who, again, can can exert expertise in culture and language and things like that. So, um, so I did that for a year, was in Cairo, and then I started my PhD program at the University of Chicago after that, and I was there for eight years, and during that time, I spent a year in Morocco, where I did uh, dissertation work there. Wow. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd never been in North Africa. Well, Egypt is, if you ask a specialist, Egypt is sort of, <laughs> there's this dividing line between- Exactly, like Egypt, they always, Tunisia, yeah. Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, yeah, and then yeah. Egypt is sort of its own, it's Something. not the Middle East, it's not North Africa, right? Knows, but yeah, so uh, spent time in, in in Morocco, loved it there as well. I've been back to Morocco since. I also visited Tunisia a couple of times to do some work. And um, aside from that, I, uh, I, I've traveled to, I went to Syria in 2009 before, oh, wow. the, uh, before the uprisings in 2011. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been to Beirut, which is probably my favorite city in the all the Lebanese. Okay, regardless. yeah, I like Beirut. I, my, yeah. my favorite, I love Beirut. It's probably my favorite city in the region. Uh -huh. Have not been to the Gulf yet. It's a big, okay. you know, big check mark against me, but I, I do have plans to go as soon as I can. Oh, good. Well, yeah, and especially because Saudi, they like opened up for tourist visas, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, um, which right. is great. Like, I mean, I thought I was like, what? Like, no way. I didn't think that would yeah. be happening this decade, but. Yeah, okay. no kidding. No kidding. <laughs> So, um, wow. Okay. And then what made you decide to, okay, I'm going to be a professor. Like I'm going to teach. Yeah. I, uh, when I was an undergrad, I had a choice between going to graduate school, like M MA PhD for, you know, language and literature or something like that, or being a lawyer, uh, going to law school and being a lawyer. And, um, you know, I sort of tried things that you do in both of those tracks. So I interned at a law firm for a summer. I, um, I sat in on law school classes. On the other side, you know, I kind of already had a sense of what people do when they study literature, but I sat in on a graduate class for literature, talked to people who were in PhD programs, talked to professors and decided, you know, I had a general sense that going the academic route would be, would be better for me. And I haven't regretted the decision. I think law school and being a lawyer is great for some people, but for me personally, it, it was a better decision to, to go the other way. So, and ever since then, you know, I found things along the way to, uh, to kind of keep me going. So, you know, it, it's simple stuff too. Nothing too grandiose. Like I remember being about to graduate from BYU and thinking, man, it's a good thing that I got into a graduate program because I love having library access. If I did not have, you know, that little username and password to be able to sign in and access all this, you know, eBooks and, uh, and just have, you know, library privileges to check stuff out for six months or more. Anyway, it was simple things like that, that mm -hmm. sort of led me towards a, a kind of life where I always want books to be a part of what I do. I always want going to the library and that kind of stuff. So this early sense that these were things that I enjoyed kind of led me down a path where I could, uh, I could go into academia. Yeah. And, and how did your, I'm curious, cause like, uh, I'm curious how your family reacted when you said like, you're going to study Arabic and all Cause you know, as native English speaker, as American, you know, U.S. citizen, like there's all this kind of like the stereotypes and all this, yeah. you know, um, bad PR. So I'm curious, like how, how did that work out? Yeah, my family I think was par for the course as far as this goes, which is not too much depth of knowledge about the region and what they do know is a little bit, uh, it's unfamiliar and maybe a little bit scary, which uh, I understand now. There used to be a time when I was more cynical about this and thought like, why don't people know more about this stuff? Um, I've come around now to understand that that's kind of how it is for everyone. So if you talk to, I don't know, uh, 
if you talk to a lawyer or a judge, you know, we don't really know that much about what they do unless you really press them on it. Even though there are tons of movies where, you know, someone gets up and gives an impassioned speech in front of a courtroom. And that's like every young person's dream when they're thinking about being a lawyer. Most lawyers don't go to court. <laughs> do that. They can avoid it. Yeah, right. The only ones who do that are public defenders or like JAG officers in the military. <laughs> Otherwise, like most of your time as a lawyer, you spend reading and writing. It's a simple example, but, you know, I try to see it from that perspective, like, yeah, most people in America and in many places in Europe have never been to the Middle East. Many of them haven't ever met a Muslim in their lives. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I try to have a more sort of generous attitude, um, if nothing else, because it, it helps me stay you know, centered. Well, that's what I love, like hearing about, like, you know, like non-native Arabic speakers who learn it like you and me, I feel it's like, it's great because I feel like we're kind of like kind of the best like, ambassadors for like, right. you know, first of all, there's like the religion is not the same thing as the language. And, right. you know, there are tons, millions of like Christian Arabs and this whole, like, I don't know, it's just this right. whole thing. Like, right. Uh, yeah, that's, that's generally how I look at it. I do have to be careful with that. Sometimes I was speaking with a, uh, a woman from India, who's a, a Muslim and she lives in Qatar and she was telling me that. I, I mentioned just what you said, I, you know, I said, you know, for me, someone who's studied the region and spent time among the Muslims, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's a privilege to be able to talk to other people and kind of help them understand a bit better, kind of, and, and I've also heard other Muslims say, you know, every Muslim is an ambassador for Islam, and she looked at me and said, that's a lot of pressure on one person, you know, to represent <laughs> the entire religion, um, you know, because I hate to even have to be able to say this, but Muslims, just like everyone else, are individual people who have individual opinions and how they practice and how they look at their religion or even their relationship with God and these other sort of sacred things. Oh, will yeah. Differ from person to person. Well, that's the thing is like you have to separate the religion and the language. Like I, I right. feel like okay, like for me, I'm I'm a fa like I'm a student. I call it like a student of light. Like I think learning is the thing. Like it's right. all about education. I'm not asking like anybody to convert to Islam. I'm not and and like you know I respect everybody's religion. It's just knowledge, you know, like right. about the language, and that's what I'm passionate about. So um, that's right. Yeah, definitely. I think and I think a lot of even like Muslims, like on that note of um people like you know being ambassadors, I feel actually a lot of. I know in Saudi, like they're raised to, to believe like you represent Saudi, you represent right. the king, right. you represent the religion. And yeah. so whenever somebody does something bad and it's bad press, it's like, you know, who am I? You met and I'm like, I know, like I, for, I believe like you only represent yourself. Um, so like, but, but a lot of people like they're not raised that way. Um, so right. it's just like interesting, like the, the whole like thing about that, like about religion and yeah, I mean, it partly has to do with culture. America, I think more than any other or most other countries is very individualistic. And, um, you know, to, to a way where that sort of, that, that, that attitude and that sort of way of approaching your life and ordering your life kind of gets, like what we, what we think of as, I think the point you, we were making is what we think of as Islam ends up being also cultural attitudes where uh, you know, family or community or these other things, it's much more community oriented and group oriented in some ways. And this isn't unique to Islam. It's not unique to the region. I know people in East Asia in traditional cultures there um, think the same way. So um, yeah, uh, it's something as, as an American that I've had to, come, I've come to appreciate about the region, about the people, uh, which is this sort of communal aspect. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, I think, you know, it's really amazing like that you you study Arabic poetry and literature. Um, can you talk yeah. a bit more about that? Sure. Sorry, I'm adjusting my pop filter. Uh, yeah, so I've always been a literature kid. Um, you know, my dad growing up would like read poetry with me when we were going to sleep and stuff like that. So um, you know, early memories of, of really enjoying reading. And then pretty early on, I discovered that I liked writing. So none of these though had, neither of these things had to do with foreign languages. For me, foreign languages felt like math, which was like my great arch nemesis when I was growing up. Uh, you know, it always felt like learning a foreign languages, there was a right and wrong answer, which that's what math felt like. And to me, it was like too confining. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what if you get the wrong answer? Well, you're wrong. So, um, but, you know, growing up, obviously being an older, you come to see that's not the case. So being in Brazil, learning Portuguese uh, to a high level of fluency meant that I could, uh, I could sort of play with the language in the way that I liked to with English. And I thought, oh, I want to go to college. I want to learn another language that I can do that with too. 
uh, and I didn't know what it would be, but it ended up being Arabic. So yeah, the literature thing has always been near to my heart in any language since growing up. And early in my Arabic study, I came to find that Arabic has a long and rich tradition of literature in general and poetry in particular. Poetry traditionally has been the sort of great literary art form of the Arabs. Uh, and they, you know, ended up exporting that to other cultures too. So Persian, Ottoman, Turkish, Urdu, you know, they all sort of picked up on and then recast and reworked norms from the Arabic poetic tradition. So it, it really, and, and, and especially like certain forms of literature became like global in, in this way uh, from Arabic. So all that's to say, you know, growing up, having already a, a propensity for to, to read and to enjoy literature, coming into Arabic meant that, uh, you know, it was a real treat for me to find that this was the case. I thought, well, I'll ha have to continue with it now. <laughs> um, like, as a professor, I'm like, so you're teaching also, you're teaching Arabic poetry? You're... When I can. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the kind of thing that, you know, when you study Arabic, as with any native English speaker, um, you know, studying a, a foreign language that is quite difficult from a native English speaker's perspective, like where you're starting from. Because if you're a native Hebrew speaker, for example, Arabic would be pretty, you, you could pick it up pretty quick. But for a native English speaker, uh, you know, you go through these certain stages where you learn vocab and grammar kind of early on. And then you start with media Arabic or media Chinese or whatever it is, you know, and you learn, learn to read newspapers in, in that. And that is most of what most undergrads in America get in an undergraduate degree in Arabic, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, for the most part, they're unfamiliar with these other kind of discourses, as we say, you know, uh, rarely have they read novels and short stories. You know, there are classes and that kind of thing, but uh, it's rare. Even op-eds uh, can be a struggle just because it's a different tone and register. You know, it's not sort of cut and dried objective language. You're using metaphorical and symbolic language. You're using cultural allusions and quotations from different mm -hmm. things. So uh, all that can be difficult to access. And then you take poetry, which exploits those things as much as possible to create aesthetic effects. So what I like to do when teaching Arabic poetry is to start off by reading an English poem yeah. and saying, you know, going through and taking it apart and looking at how, how many echoes there are in each word, how rhyme and meter work together to create a certain aesthetic effect, how allusions to other texts and other poems and things work. And then to say, this is the kind of thing that we're dealing with. This is not, you know, a front page news article where this happened and then this happened and then this official said something about it and whatnot. It's not cut and dried like that. So to be able to sort of get them into, to understand like what kind of language and what kind of discourse they're working with. So uh, all that's to say that I, I do get to teach Arabic poetry and that's kind of where I, uh, you know, it's where my heart is and all my students will know that about me, uh, <laughs> that it's, it's hard Who's for me your, to like, go ahead. Go your ahead. favorite like poet or poem. Oh man, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna create some enemies. Uh, actually the, the safe answer, and actually this is the true answer too, is al Mutanabbi. So okay. al Mutanabbi was a, uh, a 10th century poet uh, his name means the would-be prophet. There's a story about him. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, there's a, a, poem, uh, a story about him. Supposedly, he sort of led a revolt from out of the desert, gathered some some desert tribes behind him, and came out of the desert with like his own Quran and, and tried to proclaim himself as a prophet. It's probably apocryphal. There's no way to to, wow. <laughs> to verify it historically. Wow. Yeah. So this is one thing uh, that I like about teaching Arabic literature, but that it's also you know, means I have to, I have my work cut out for me, which is that I think 99% of people who, 99% uh, of English readers anyway, are familiar with the Quran and the Thousand and One Nights. And that's what they know of Arabic poetry. And you might add to that Rumi, but then I have to oh, say yeah, Rumi, it's, right? it's close, that's close, but he wrote in Persian. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Oh, I didn't uh, even know that. That's typically what people, yeah, right. So that's typically what people know, which is fine. Again, it's, I'm, I'm generous about this kind of stuff. It's like, I know where, I know where to start with, with this kind of stuff. So Al-Mutanabi is the great poet of the Arabs. Typically people haven't heard of him in the West, but that's okay because, you know, that means I have a chance to introduce him. <laughs> no, that's so, so cool. Wow. What yeah. are his, what's, what are his poems like about, about like love or like law? So he, it's funny that like some of these great sort of golden age poets in Arabic wrote what basically we would think of today as like propaganda or commercials. 
So what they would do is they would set up the, the plum position for a poet back in his day, you know, in ninth and 10th century Baghdad was to be a court poet. And what that meant is you would be hired by some patron or a ruler and you would sit at court and write poetry extolling the virtues of that ruler. You are, you know, so brave in battle. You are so generous at hall. Uh, you know, you, uh, you take care of people. You're magnanimous. Uh, you're, you're pious. You know, you do all the things that Islam says. You so um, to a modern reader, it sounds really artificial. <laughs> Um, but the, it's more the artistry than the content that, uh, people love about this kind of stuff. And, you know, there, there is something to the, the content as well in terms of, um, uh, you know, understanding the relationship between historical reality, which there were actual rulers and there were actual events that these poets were talking about, but then you sort of imagine them and, and sort of blow them up in your mind a little bit. Anyway, al Mutanabi wrote this kind of, he's most famous for writing this kind of poetry. Oh, wow. And um, what do your students find like most challenging about your classes? Well, I mean, Arabic is pretty challenging all on its own, which is part of the reason I wanted to teach it is uh, the students who come and study Arabic are tend to be self-selecting. They tend to be the kind of people who are willing to work hard, uh, who are willing to put in the time I wanted students who were like that. And I didn't wanna, you know, as much as possible, I wanted to let the subject matter itself do that selecting for me, which is partly why I chose Arabic. Mm. Um, aside from that, you know, again, sort of literary discourse is very difficult or even just sort of meta metaphorical language. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, a, a, a phrase as simple as Ibn al bat awam. So the mm. son of a duck is a swimmer, which, it's a it's a popular saying and in English it translates it, it's equivalent to the apple never falls far from the tree. Ah, oh, I like so, that. Yeah. Um, I hadn't heard that one before. Ibn al -Bat Awam. Yeah. Habayt, so, it's nice. <laughs> yeah. So even simple things like that, which is why in, in sort of early in, in first and second year Arabic classes, I try to incorporate expressions like that in phrases, you know, uh, or even even religious expressions or things from the Quran, like masha'Allah or insha'Allah. You know, it's mm -hmm. difficult to, um, it's difficult to get across how common these phrases are just because we don't really speak this way in English. We used right. to, two generations ago, people would say, you know, it was much more common to hear people say, may God strike me dead if I'm lying. You know, God oh, help really? him, God uh -huh. save him. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Grandparents and great-grandparents, their generation, um, okay. they used to speak like this oh, more commonly. God bless you, God bless your heart. The right, so God. my grandmother, whenever I sneeze, my grandmother would say, God bless you, okay. which is, is what we're saying when we say bless you. Bless you, uh-huh. Um, but anyway, it's, I think it was more common, you know, back then, but still very common in Arabic. And anyway, the, the point is that yeah. these things are often difficult for students to sort of wrap their heads around at first, but these are some of the most rewarding things when they finally do get them. Oh, I agree 100%. And on the whole topic of using Allah, like I've said this before in one of my videos, like I would say it's near impossible to be a fluent speaker, like in terms of like getting around in the Middle East without using Allah all the time. Alhamdulillah, yeah. Bismillah, right. yeah, Inshallah, like right. all the time. I, I mean, and then there are people who, you know, oh, well, that Allah is a Muslim word. I don't want to right. use that. I'm right. like, you know, yeah. what, you know, God with the capital G, but you know what, even if you're, you don't believe in a God, that's fine, but you still need to say like, I mean, what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, this is something that what you said about people sort of um, resisting it a little bit, like native speakers, Arabs resisting <laughs> a little bit. Um, this is something I've paid, tried to pay more attention to in, in recent years, because, you know, as a, as an Arabic learner in the West, I too, you know, grew up in Arabic, learning all these sort of religious expressions. And you know, since then have met lots of native speakers who don't use them and specifically because they're secular. Uh, oh. And so, yeah, so I, I, you know, I'm inclined to like pepper my language with these things but I have to be aware of who I'm talking to so that oh, I don't come off sounding like I'm, I'm posing or something. Oh, cause I mean, I use them all the time and I feel like it helps me fit in better. I mean, yeah, people it, will it, say, are you Muslim? And I just say, I'm, Ruhani, I'm spiritual, not religious is all I say. Um, yeah. But like, nobody's ever come to me, but I've heard of people saying that, oh, they, they say Allah, then then Muslims will say to them, oh, don't use that unless you're Muslim. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm gonna say what, I, 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 I don't know, I think it helps me fit in, but. Yeah, it, it really, for me, it depends on your audience, it depends on who you're talking to. You know, mm -hmm. so I have colleagues who are, who are very, you know, very devout practicing Muslims. 
Yeah. And um, they, they very much appreciate the fact that I'm familiar with this verbiage and, and can use it. You know, on the other hand, I have a colleague at BYU who is Syrian and very secular. And, okay. you know, he never, he never says anything, but like, if I say it too much, like he might blanch a little bit and be like, yeah, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot. Oh. Um, it just, again, it sort of, it sort of depends on who you're talking to, but you're right. It, in, in many circumstances, I've found that people, they like, they appreciate the time that I've taken to sort of incorporate this aspect of the language and how I talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think, I mean, as a professor, what do you think is the most, um, I would say, or the best advice you would give for somebody who is thinking about learning Arabic? Yeah, it's a good question. And, uh, you know, how much time do you have? I could go on and on about this kind of thing. Uh, so I don't want to, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to go overboard, but, um, you know, you first have to know your goals with Arabic. Uh, and a corollary to that is you have to accept that learning Arabic is something that never ends. You know, at some point you have, everyone has to make a decision whether Arabic is going to be their whole life or not, just because it's, it's that big you know, it's been around for 1500 years, or I mean, probably longer than that, probably more like 2000 years, uh, if you start earlier, and, um, you know, you can just go and go and go forever. There's always a new dialect to learn, you know, there's always some new technical uh, terms to learn. Um, you know, so unless you want to become a professor like me, or <laughs> like an Arabic entrepreneur like you and totally <laughs> devote your life to it, then, uh, then you have to know your goals so that you can focus on the things that you need. So someone who's gonna be a journalist, you know, that person needs to be familiar with Fusha, with media yeah. Arabic, and probably speak a dialect passably so that they can talk to sources. That person does not need to be an expert in grammar. That person does not need to, you know, have a deep reading in sort of the classical tradition. If you're gonna be, you know, an aid worker, it's less important for you to read and write Fusha than it is for you to be very good at dialects. So you can understand what people are saying when they're expressing a need for something or you know, trying, to, trying to do something. Uh, so know your goals, accept that learning Arabic is just, you're just always gonna be working at it, uh, which also leads me to say, you should be willing to, if you know that it's important to your future, you should be willing to invest some time and money into it. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, for me, I'm going on 16 years studying and now teaching Arabic. And uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a long process. And again, if you know that, if you, if you discover at one point that, yes, I want to make Arabic a big part of my life professionally, personally, whatever, you know, um, you know, some time spent in the region, some money spent on textbooks or something else, you know, it's going to be money well spent. Um, I would also say it's so important to make friends with Arabs. Mm -hmm. If if you, I mean, you need to recognize it's a living culture and with that, that there are lots and lots of people out there who obviously are Arabs and speak Arabic. Um, if you don't live in an Arabic speaking country and you're not in a place where you can easily, uh, you know, find native speakers to talk to, there are services out there. There's one called Netakalem. Okay. And uh, if you want to write that up on your comments, yeah, I can write it up how it's spelled or whatever. But yeah. it's, it's, it's a service that connects you with a native uh, Arabic speaking partner. Oh, wow. And, uh, and you pay a certain number of, you pay a certain amount per session. Uh, and uh, it's not super expensive. You can talk to people that way though, and, and get familiar with, you know, practice your Arabic, but then also meet people. And you can choose like a dialect. I, I believe so. I haven't looked at it recently, but uh, okay. I, I think you can. Very um, cool. Yeah. You got to use Arabic every day. You know, you gotta think of Arabic as a tool for tasks that you need to do on a regular basis. So if I'm talking with Arab colleagues, I try to write emails to them in Arabic whenever possible. Um, another thing with this is, you know, use social media to communicate in Arabic. Something that I've really found um, helpful is being on Twitter because I don't have to write, you know, a whole email. I don't have to write like a whole, you know, essay or whatever in Arabic. You know, I just shoot out two or three sentences in Arabic mm -hmm. or, you know, a quick, a quick DM to someone in uh, in Arabic, and it's great. You know, it, it's great for networking. People really appreciate when I can speak with them in Arabic. And, um, and why did yeah. you choose uh, American Maghreb? I know I noticed your your Twitter user in American oh. <laughs> Maghreb. Yeah. So so why did you choose that? Well, so I love the Maghreb. I love Morocco. I love Tunisia. I haven't been to Algeria yet, but like you know, God willing, I'll, I'll get together someday. Inshallah. So I love I love North Africa. Morocco is my favorite. 
um, you know, with, with, and I, and I love every Arab country, but Morocco especially is very close to my heart. Wow. But um, isn't the dialect hard? Like I've heard it because if, if you're used to speaking like even like Egyptian or like a uh, Khaliji or another, like, you know, one of the other dialects, like, yeah. okay. So tell me about Moroccan dialect. Yeah. So, um, a lot of it for me has to do with, uh, where they place vowels. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So in Egyptian, it's yatakallam or even in, in Fusha, it's yatakallam. In, uh, in Moroccan to say they speak is kihdru, kihdru. So the, the oh. yeah, so the, the, the rhythm of the word, the, the rhythm of the words is different. The rhythm of a sentence is different. Uh, small changes make it sort of hard to hear at first and then also speak. So in, in Egyptian and Levantine dialects, you know, you have a, a present progressive marker, ba, bahab, batkalem, oh, yeah. bahki, you know. Uh, in so, Morocco, yeah, yeah. Yeah. in Moroccan and also Algerian, that's k. So it's not b, it's k. Ah, okay. Yeah. So their present progressive marker is kaf, not b. So uh, it's small things like that. With when you add them up together, they will also use different words, which is you know anyone who knows Arabic dialects knows this that the same concept exists in all these dialects. It's just a different word for it. So matar in you know many dialects rain is shta in arabic which is just the word for winter shitta oh shitta uh, in, in in moroccan in shitta moroccan. is the rain shta. yeah shta. Uh, uh. right because because well. the because the winter is the rainy season ah oh, wow right. so uh yeah so you know a couple of simple examples from from moroccan dialect which was part of the reason i enjoyed being there because you know this was a challenge for me to to try and learn the the dialect so yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I really, I really like the Maghrib as a region like North Africa, I like Morocco. Yes. But my Twitter handle. And uh, the, mm -hmm. the other reason is I live in Utah, which is the American West. And uh -huh. oh, <laughs> so, that makes sense. Okay. So I thought, and it's also, it's also reminiscent of many places in the Middle East. Um, you know, I, I have servicemen and women in my classes, some of them, and uh, they know people who come here as battalions and train in the mountains because they'll be, you know, doing missions and stuff in parts of the world that are very similar to, you know, in, in the Middle East mm -hmm. um, that are similar to the kind of topography and the kind of uh, environment we have here in Utah. Do you have so, students who are actually like Arab, from Arab family like, do, who are speakers? Because I, I, I used to do Spanish and they're always native Spanish speakers. And so the teacher right. would be really hard on them. Right. Yeah. So I don't have as many, these are called heritage speakers for those who are oh, unfamiliar with uh, Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's fine. Just for, for in deference to listeners who might not be familiar. Uh, so I don't have that many heritage speakers at BYU just because the, the population of the school being what it is, there aren't that many, um, there aren't many native speakers. Uh, once in a while, I'll get someone who has heritage in their family, but typically they grow up, they've grown up speaking English and are trying to actually recuperate, uh, you know, some of their, their family's heritage. So one example was I had a student who was on the BYU football team and uh, his last name was El Bakri. Hmm. He didn't grow up speaking Arabic, but I knew right away, you know, having spent time around the language and the culture that this was an Arab name. So I asked him about it and his grandfather turns out is Iraqi and his grandmother is Italian. So not hmm. only did he get like two great cultures, but also, and, and two great like food, food traditions too. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, <laughs> um, man. But, uh, but, you know, he, he, he wanted to, he, he wanted to show his grandfather that his heritage meant something to him and to his credit did, did, you know, a, a good job in the class. So, uh, yeah. So oh. every so often, that's typically what, what, uh, what you get. So not as many heritage speakers. It's something, it's a different kind of teaching experience to teach a heritage speaker mm -hmm. just because um, often they do come with, you know, a high level of Arabic, but in certain contexts, you know, they've right. spoken it at home, um, you know, and talk about every, are able to talk about everyday things, but very quickly, if you start talking to them in sort of literate Arabic, Exa uh, poetry, right. Mm -hmm. uh, or even, even newspapers, you know, oh. they're, they're not used to reading and writing in Arabic. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that's kind of where you hit, you hit uh, uh, the first wall with heritage speakers. And then after that, you have to, you know, focus with them more on, on Fusfa and reading and writing. Got it. Very cool. Well, yeah. last question. Sure. Even though, like, I would love to talk for like hours. Um, <laughs> tell me about like what's like maybe like the craziest thing that happened to you when you were in the Middle East, or like something like, or when you were learning Arabic. Like any like stories you want to share? 
Oh man. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I don't know about crazy. I mean, there's, there's some crazy, crazy things that can happen to you. Um, but, uh, let me think. I, uh, I always enjoyed, you know, um, being abroad, watching major events unfold from outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I was, I've never been like caught up in a, uh, like in a major, uh, you know, a major agitation or something like that. But I was in Egypt in 2009 and 2010. So this was a year before the Arab uprisings in 2011. And anyone who was in Cairo at that time could have told you that something was going on. Mm. That there were there were protests all the time. Um, you know, there were there were bread riots and things like that. So uh, being able to kind of see all that up close on the ground. And then two years later, I was in my PhD program for Arabic, surrounded by lots of other people who care very deeply about the Middle East. They're there studying the Middle East and Arabic and other things. Um, and so being with them, watching the Arab uprisings happen was a really sweet experience because I was able to like relate with other people and kind of talk to them in a way that I couldn't talk to other people who don't mm -hmm. have this experience in the region. Um, so being there during that time, I was also there, you know, when Obama came in 2009 to give his famous Cairo speech. Uh, wow. yeah, I was in Cairo at that time. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wasn't able to, it was an invitation only thing. I, I wasn't able to go to the speech, but I, I watched it in a cafe, you know, surrounded by Egyptians and they were very hopeful, you know, this is a new change and uh, in, in US rhetoric in the region. Uh, in 2017, I was in Jerusalem when then newly elected President Trump made his first visit to Israel. Uh, you know, I saw his motorcade pass by, and uh, there were <laughs> there were there were pro and anti Trump gatherings like in the streets uh -huh. and stuff like that. A lot of pro, uh, if you can believe it. You know, these in, these young in Israel. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> there yeah, are a lot of this... pro in Saudi too. Like a lot of a lot of the yeah. Khalij is a very pro Trump. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. At uh, at at the time of speaking, by the way, this was just after you know we're what day. Was it yesterday that uh, Trump supporters stormed the Capitol? So, yeah, yeah. So we're yeah. like we're we're less than you know a full twenty four hours away from you know what many people are calling a, an insurrection mm -hmm. <laughs> within the United States. Well, crazy twenty twenty one already off to right. An interesting yeah, off start. to off to a good start. But um, you know, being being in being outside of the country where I grew up and seeing these things unfold helped me understand my what we what we'd say is positionality as an American right you know how other people see me as a well, white American Go well ahead. on that topic as a white American who speaks Arabic and I ask this to everybody because I get I get it all the time sure Helena Filistikbarat like the whole like did you get that did you get detained you know what I mean <laughs> yeah um no no I mean Plus, all, yeah yeah, yeah. But. no I well I, I you know this is this is again helpful for me to understand how people see someone like me, uh, someone who you know is familiar with Arab culture, speaks Arabic, you know, mm -hmm. passably. I uh, you speak I was well. <laughs> in, uh, thanks. I was in I was in Morocco, and uh, I was studying dialect with a tutor, and I you know told her about experiences I had talking to cabbies, you know, getting in taxis and talking to them in Moroccan dialect, which for a a white Westerner is very unique. I guess, to say the least. Um, you know, most Westerners will come there speaking Fusha or either Egyptian or Levantine dialect, but uh, it's rare to see someone, you know, speak and try to speak Moroccan with you. So they were always surprised and, uh, you know, it sort of like didn't compute in some ways. So I asked her about this reaction. She said, for many Moroccans, and this isn't everyone, I'm not trying to, you know, paint everyone with the same brush, but she said, for many Moroccans, you know, someone like you, uh, you know, average simple Moroccans who like don't have as much exposure as someone like me who comes from a foreign country uh, to study this language, you know, the question in their minds is, are you Muslim or are you a spy? Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> which, you know, is, is an understandable reaction. And again, I'm not saying that about everyone right. in the Middle East. That's not how they, but, you right. know, in the same way that people in America, you know, have kind of th their impressions about Muslims and Arabs. Yeah, that's true. You know, Arabs who have lived in their same town for their whole lives, who might not have gone to college. I knew so many people in Morocco who dropped out early, even in high school, to help their families work. You know, these people don't have as wide an experience. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an understandable reaction. Like, why would this whitey come here 
and uh, and learn not just fusha, but like my dialect. Which yeah, you want to learn my lahja. You want to learn all this, all my, you know, amthal, yeah. all my secrets and yeah. everything. <laughs> but I mean, it, the the overwhelming majority of people, I mean, in fact, I can't think of a native Arabic speaker who I've met who has not really appreciated anyone like you or me who takes the time and effort to learn the language, to spend time in the region, to really appreciate the religion, the culture, all that kind of stuff. It's been, I mean, it's, I, I always, I always, you know, uh, I, I have to thank everyone. Cause you know, again, I've been doing this for, mm -hmm. you know, 16 years and, uh, how many times have I have, I'm sure people have like, you know, been on the verge of losing patience with me when I like, can't say something right. Or, uh, you know, I'm not familiar with, or, or, or make a, uh, a, a same here. Call. Yeah. Mesa, yeah. Yeah. If yeah. I right. mess up. Right. Yeah. Anyway. But yeah, they're so, that's the thing is like, I think that um, they really love it when somebody's learning their language or speak, you know, Absolutely. and it's just like kind of, yeah, I love, I love that about it. It's like, because they, they, they appreciate that it's not an easy language. Yeah, that's right. And, when, and you know, that's, I'm not trying to be, um, I don't want to sound like paternalistic or anything. Like I'm, I'm like the Arab whisperer, you know, <laughs> trying to <laughs> no, like, no, no, introduce but, people. But, like, but, right, for yeah. but for, you know, for listeners who've never, you know, who, who maybe are just starting off with Arabic, um, you know, who haven't spent a lot of time around Arabs, you know, that it's a culture of, it's a guest host culture, which means that they're very giving, they're very generous, just kind of in general. Oh yeah. Arab just, hospitality is like the best. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Right. It's, 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 you know, it's proverbial Arab hospitality. And, uh, and the same goes true with attitudes towards language, you know, any little effort that you can make towards showing that, you know, something about Arabic, it's appreciated, which I like. Oh man. Yeah. I see. That's one thing I, I did have a little bit of people ask me like, Oh, did you have culture shock after seven years in <sighs> Dubai? Yeah. Actually, you know, cause when you go to parties in, in the middle East, at least in, in the, the Khalij, it's a 10 people invited. They have food for a hundred. Right. That's you know, right. like, and it's yeah. just like, you know, yeah. and, and they have big walls around their houses, but it's actually mm -hmm. for privacy. And a lot of people like they're taking like, oh, it's like they're, you know, it's scary to have these huge walls. Whereas in America, we just have our yards and all. But no, like if you actually like say hi, I'm the, the come have food, yeah. stay a while, stay yeah. for the week. You know, it's just like, yeah. and, and, and that's one thing I really love and I miss. Yeah, it's it's so it's so easy to just make friends and and spend time, you know. I mean, like you know, days can fall off the calendar when you're just like talking to people and eating food and enjoying yeah. yourself, you know. That's one thing I love about about the Middle East. Oh, and and you're go no, you're going to Denmark next week, right? Yeah, I am. <laughs> so <laughs> so is, tell yeah, so yeah. last thing, tell us about this. Yeah, it was, so the Denmark is obviously not the Middle East, but <laughs> I know uh, that's what I'm saying. Like Denmark, <laughs> yeah. I was like, you're going to uh, no, you're going to Denmark. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going. I'm going to to be in residence at a university there that's hosting me for a few months um, to do some research. They have a uh, so I'm a, I'm a classical Arabist, which means I study old stuff in Arabic, and they have a center for medieval studies at this university. So I'm going there to be to do some research um, as part of a team. We're just looking at sort of texts from you know pre-modern sort of ancient well not ancient but medieval um cultures not just in europe so they're interested medieval studies in general uh is interested in sort of globalizing so traditionally it's been a european focused field um but uh, like so many fields now they want to see what's beyond europe and incorporate that into how they do things so um mm. you know i, I i'm part of that effort, I think, um, you know, they have people who they've, they've hosted Sanskritists before people who work on, you know, um, classical Indian texts and, um, and, and they try to cast a wide net. There's someone else there who, who works on Byzantine. So this is medieval Greek stuff. Oh. So, uh, we were looking at, um, looking at old texts and specifically commentaries. So pe how people write about texts and even their own texts kind of like director's commentary like if you have a oh. uh, if you have a movie and you get the mm -hmm. director's cut you know yeah. the director will be like in this scene I wanted to do this this and this kind of thing oh. um, so you have things like this in um, it's like an author's preface to you know uh, if to a novel or whatever if they're putting out a second or third edition of a novel an author will be like well looking back you know 20 years later after I wrote this thing here's what I have to say about it there's all kinds of stuff like that in uh, in medieval texts so we're just going to be looking at that and uh, trying to trying to come to some conclusions about it. Well, that sounds incredible. I uh, wish you all the best of luck and and um, enjoy Denmark. And thank you thank again you. so, so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. I appreciate the invitation.